can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And uh, before I introduce formally today's guest, uh, Grant Johnson has been in the agency world since 1989. And if anyone knows or listens, I um, geek out on direct response marketing. Um, So I've had some amazing people on. So Grant, I always like to point out other uh, episodes people should check out. And so from the direct response world, I had... um, Ron Paul Peel on people should check out that interview and unfortunately may rest in peace. He, he died, um, recently. Um, I've had, uh, Brian Kurtz on, I've had, um, you name it, just like hundreds, hundreds of people on, um, and also from the agency side, I've had people like Gray McKenzie of Zen pilot who specialize in helping agencies move on to click up John Doherty of credo, which connects companies to the right agencies for their needs. John Morris, uh, his story was amazing. He built his agency up to 200 people then sold it, now consults with companies to help them grow. So check out that and many more. And the episode today is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, Grant, for me, um, you've probably found out by now the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships. and profile them, their company, what they're doing, the exciting things that they're working on. And I've found no better way over the past decade to do that than to have them on my podcast. So if you've thought about it, go to rise25.com, check out more. You could email us at support at rise25media.com. We're happy to answer any and all questions that you have. And today's guest, I'm excited, Grant Johnson's the CEO and founder of Responsory. And like I mentioned, he started in 1999, but he was in the agency world since 1988. And when people ask what he does, uh, Grant says, um, I'm a drug dealer. I was reading that on LinkedIn. It says drug dealer, yeah, a true great direct response marketer because it captures your curiosities. You have to read more. So he's done stuff in pharma, vitamins, nutraceuticals. He says, I'm an insurance salesperson, which is not quite as compelling as saying I'm a drug dealer, but uh, you know, health specialty in life insurance. He sells chemicals uh, in a myriad of B2B products, manufacturing services. Um, They work with companies like Humana, Northwestern Mutual, Microsoft, Blue Cross Blue Shield in various states, and many, many more companies over the years. And their process combines data, AI, and testing to deliver multi-channel marketing campaigns to make their clients a hero and ultimately get them ROI. So Grant, thanks for joining me. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I want you to start with um, talking about um, IMED. When I look at your website, um, IMED keeps sticking out. And there's, I encourage anyone to go to responsory.com and some of the work you've done. And there's this image of this person in a cage with a shark coming up to them. Um, so I love that image. And it talks about four essential B2B email marketing tactics in action. You've been doing email marketing for years and years and years. Yes. Um, so talk about what uh, IMED Vision Care and in, in some email marketing. Yeah, so um, IMED is the insurance arm of <clears throat> Luxottica, and uh, a lot of people uh, know Luxottica, but they don't know they know Luxottica. Luxottica is um, Ray Ban sunglasses. It is just about every optical chain you can think of. Um, Target Optical. Uh, they they own so many brands. It's it's crazy. But on the B2B side, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get um, companies to understand that IMED has an insurance product. Um, it's a good product. Uh, they should look at it. Uh, they, they should um, con- consider at least getting a quote from IMED. And we deal with HR decision makers uh, who handle benefits. We actually deal with bro- agents and brokers as well. And one thing, not this one that's in particular that's up, but the very first um, campaign they gave us, which was really, an, I think it's an interesting B2B uh, case study, which is they, they said to us, okay, you guys do measurable marketing. Why don't you, um, here's, a, here's a list of 900 prospects. 
we know these prospects are doing business with our competitors. We have never, ever been able to quote with them, let alone meet with them. So they said, get us appointments. <laughs> and uh, I, sa- I said to the client contact, they said, oh, man, I thought, I thought you liked me. This is the first assignment you're giving us. <laughs> And uh, what we ended up, yeah, we've never been able to crack this code. Yeah, 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 good luck. Yeah, but you can. Yeah. 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 So uh, what ended up happening was, uh, I, again, I think it's a really good case study. Uh, of course, I'm biased, but it's a good case study on thinking through how marketing and sales have to align. So what we ended up doing was we did a little bit of research, of course, and um, we uh, our cadence was really uh, email, banner ads, uh, prior. The, um, dimensional direct mail, more banner ads, more emails. And then of course there was a, an option for a, um, a gift or an offer. And what we offered at that point was an echo dot. And, uh, at that point they were like 79 or 99 bucks and they were brand new. They were hot, all that kind of good stuff. And <clears throat> we sat down and said, how do we, how do we make this if we get appointments, how do we make this an event rather than just another sales call? Because of course, some people are going to say, yeah, come on, I'll spend 15 minutes with you. I get this new toy, you know, so what? So what we ended up doing, uh, and this was several years ago, is we did um, an Alexa app with it. So what we did is we had the salesperson come in and say, hey, we've been having troubles with, with these. Can we plug it in and make sure it works? And I think they just took it down, but if, if you would say, Alexa, enable IMED, uh, then what would happen is they'd go through this whole, uh, whole uh, say, not sales pitch, but welcome to IMED, here's who we are, here's how many people we insure. And of course, what ended up happening, which is what we had hoped for, was the person who was going to get this dot said, wait, I gotta get some other people to come in and see this. And even though that technology has been around for a long time, I think people That's might. It's still a cool trick. I mean, yeah. even if you did that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and a lot of people just don't, you know, they don't think through the process, but the it's real a creative, a really creative. And also, by the way, it's great for the salesperson. It takes some stress oh, off them. Yeah. If the Alexa is doing the talking at that moment. So that, that's fantastic. 15% response. Yeah. I love sold, it. Sold a lot of policies. So, yeah, it worked. Um, but again, I think that's the kind of thing that, you know, most people can do fancy creative. Uh, they don't test enough, that kind of stuff. But really, if you think through that sales cycle and how you can make that from ordinary to extraordinary, that face-to-face meeting, even a Zoom call like this, uh, you know, that, that'll that really bode well for you uh, and, you know, your chances of success in my mind. I love that thinking, Grant, because it's it's not just optimized, it's optimizing the whole process. So it's like, you're not like, oh, it stops when we get the appointment. That's when it actually begins. And that's actually when people are like, cool, we got the appointment. And how do you optimize that piece of, right. of the process? And so I'm curious from the, you know, you obviously take a multi-channel approach to get in the room, to put that offer in front of them, and then deliver this amazing kind of cool presentation and event. What or and I, you know, what I gravitate towards, I hear all this stuff, but I hear dimensional direct mail, and that's where my mind goes because I love yeah. hearing about what were some, what are some cool examples, maybe in this case that you sent out, or even across other campaigns, because I think the art of that, you know, we're so used to getting bombarded with email and all this stuff, and you could stick out from the crowd with that, but uh, I just love dimensional direct mail. Yeah, I I can tell you one. Uh... And, and again, this is going to seem crazy, but again, it's B2B. So on B2B, you can spend a lot more money on a prospect. Your cost per lead can be very high if the close rate is there as well, right? So again, things you have to factor in. So we had a bank uh, that was trying to, it was a Wisconsin-based bank that was trying to penetrate the, the business side of companies in Chicago. And if anybody's worked in any major city, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, LA, media costs are just ridiculous. So they came to us and said, you know, we can, we can afford a really nice gift. So you guys come back with something that you, you think is going to, you know, really work. So 
what we had at that time was there was this, this little um, device. And if you would turn the device on, on any hard surface, it would create a keyboard. And hmm. it was just a little device and it, it was, it's pretty cool. And uh, so that was part of the, um, part of the dimensional direct mail that came. And then believe it or not, uh, if they would set up an appointment with a banker, uh, they would get an iPad. We would bring an iPad to them. And people are like, oh, great case study. Of course, it's going to be successful. Well, not necessarily because these are busy people. They can buy their own iPads if they want. They, you know, they, they really don't need them. But uh, it's a really good example of people going, wow, this is, you know, this is a really cool thing. Now, the one thing I always caution about um, dimensional mail and any type of offer you make is if it's too good to be true, it probably is. If I'm selling you a Montblanc pen and say, hey, you buy this Montblanc pen and you get a Jaguar, I don't think many people are going to respond because they're going to go, yeah, really, it'll probably be a Matchbox or a Hot Wheels. <laughs> right. well, not, What's the catch? Yeah, 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 exactly. What's the catch? And people are skeptical. They're even more skeptical today. But again, a lot of this stuff can be proved or disproved through testing. And um, I'm going to just, just jump in for a second. A really good example, again, uh, that I, I see all the time in B2B that's not done is just basic segmentation. How, I've, I, I don't have to treat everybody as homogeneous, or I shouldn't actually, because what the CEO is thinking is different when the, what the technology person is thinking is different than what the operations and what the finance person is thinking. So just by simple segmentation, you'll have more success. And I would say well over 90% of the campaigns that we're invited into, they are not doing basic segmentation. They're not doing testing. If they're driving them to a landing page, which of course we highly recommend, um, they're not testing that. The, that's when the sale really begins because I'm clicking and going, uh, all right, Dr. Jeremy, uh, you know, you're saying, okay, I'm interested. And then people just think, okay, I'm just going to tell you all about myself. But that's when the selling really needs to kick in. And, you know, a lot of people forget that. And uh, those are a couple of things that I would, I would recommend everybody at least think about because they'll, they'll increase your success. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things you talk about also in the, in the IMED um, example, with four essential B2B email marketing tactics is like one, you're targeting, you know, you're segmenting it so then you can personalize things and yeah. you can make a compelling offer to them. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about you, you talk about um, in their conversion driving landing pages. Yeah. Yeah. So conversion driving landing pages, again, there's a, there's a process or a template that we follow, which um, I'm happy to share with anybody if they reach out to me after hearing this. Uh, but, but really what has to happen there is, it's like, um, I'm trying to give an analogy. If, if you make a phone call in the old days because you like something off an 800 number, don't just assume I want to buy this. They always try to upsell you and that kind of stuff. But the landing pages, what happens there is reiterate the offer is one thing I always say. If, if there's an offer or, you know, or, or a compelling reason I'm clicking on, if it's a white paper, if it's a possible gift, Re, um, restate why that person clicked on there. And then, um, you know, the, the other, and the, so that, that's one thing. And then you have an option to test all sorts of different landing pages. Oh uh, yeah, here, so personalization, compelling offer and call to action. Personalization is really important. Now, a lot of people always ask me about um, pearls and pearls are okay, but if you know too much, and you pre-populate with too much, it becomes a little creepy. So you have to be really- Yeah, for people who don't know what pearls are, it's like a personalized URL, yeah. right? So like Correct. if you send someone something in the, in the mail and they click on it, it's like, oh, I, you go to it and it says something about responsoring. You know, if it's to you, it grant and responsory, they'll go and it has your stuff on there, which is kind of a cool little trick. Yeah, yeah. So, and again, so just, you know, very test centric. Um, and then, you know, again, a compelling uh, offer and call to action. That's what got them to click. So once they're on that landing page, you know, like you see in this example here, you, you got the first name, Jeremy, how valuable 
is your employee data and it you know goes into you know some statistics and that kind of stuff you got the box on the right uh and you know as far as the um the statement and then uh infographic things like that so this is a good example i believe there was one or two others we tested along with this but this was the winner and uh, there's another email another one yeah so uh, I'm curious, Grant, from this, what, what I love about this also is that the imagery is really yeah. cool. So yeah. I don't I talk about your thought process and brainstorming of the team of coming up with, yeah. you know, it just jumps out at you. You want to look and see what's going on and you totally get what the company does, you know, from, you know, I'm amongst bees and like how protected you feel and I'm amongst yeah. sharks in a cage. So how did you come up with that or test different images or, or maybe you tested a few and you came up with this? I'd love to hear yeah, that. You know, we, you know, obviously we sit down, we have a brainstorming session. We, we try to come up with a theme. And in this case, it was obviously um, had to do with um, animals and insect theme, you know. Um, and what we are trying to do is figure out how, again, how we could make it compelling, how we can make people stop. And we decided rather than a photo, use this animation tactic. Hmm. And again, if you look at your email, you don't see many emails like this in your inbox. You just know. And um, the, the image and the headline really have to just drive you into that copy. And again, I really want to reiterate that the creative, the design, it really needs, just like you said, Jeremy, pull me in. But then direct response copy is much different than traditional ad copy, right? And one of the things um, that I do when I consult with people is I take their homepage or in this case, um, an example, and then I look at how many times they mention themselves versus you. So I wanna know what's in it for me. Tell me what you're gonna solve. Re remind me of why I clicked on, things like that. And if it's not two to one that you're talking about the prospect, rewrite your copy. Because, you know, I, I, there's an assumption at this point after I clicked on that I know who you are. I believe that you're a credible company. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have clicked on this. So now it becomes, okay, what's in it for me? What problem are you going to solve? How are you going to help me? Why are you different than somebody else that I may have already? So again, I, I just think it's the, like you had alluded to earlier, uh, it's just that direct marketing mindset. So keeping in mind that the creative is designed to pull people in. And we came up with, you know, I, I think we probably presented four to six options. And then we always have a rationale behind each option. It's not like, hey, here's, a, here's an idea. What do you think of it? We have to explain the rationale behind what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. And honestly, I cannot tell you how many CEOs that I presented to in my career that said, well, we really don't like this. And my response is, I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. don't care. And they go, what, what do you mean? I'm paying your bills. I said, well, you're not our target audience. <laughs> if you are our target audience, yeah, I'm not dismissing you know your industry, but I'm not trying to sell to you. I'm trying to sell to the prospect. And their mindset is probably a little different than you, Mr. CEO, right? And uh, those are things to keep in mind. And then again, when you think about segmentation, um, you know, content that's engaging is going to relate to what they do in their job, in their job function. Years ago, we did a, uh, we, were, we were selling financial conversion software. So most financial institutions run Fiserv or some sort of software package that ties everything together. And what we did there was, again, this is heavy direct mail years ago, but what we ended up doing was we told the CEO what holistically this was going to mean. We told the technology officer how easy the integration was going to be. We talked to the CEO about what the payoff was going to be. We talked to the marketing uh, prospect about how they could really differentiate themselves versus other competitors in the market. And in, in my mind at that time, it's like, okay, everybody comes into this big conference room and they say, okay, we're, you know, we, we have to talk about the software needs we have. Lo and behold, um, the CFO says, hey, I found this company that's already told me 
what the return could be. And then they start talking and then they all figure out, hey, this is from the same company. Mm. And it's speaking their language. So we're in that case, we're reaffirming that we know it's a big step to make this investment. We also know it's going to be tedious and there might be some problems along the way, but we understand what those are because we've done this enough. And that alone is going to differentiate in that case, them. And, and even to this day, which is 15, 20 years later, uh, people still aren't doing enough of that segmentation. And why is it valuable or important to me? Yeah, I love that because everyone has their own wants and needs, even for the same product. Um, I'd love to hear, Grant, too. I know you have known um, some of the top direct, resp- you know, direct response marketers of all time and learned with them from them. Who are some of your favorites, um, maybe that are still, still around today, um, and maybe something you learned from them? Um, well, I'll start with the people that aren't around. I, I was fortunate. Um, and pretty young and naive and stupid. <laughs> uh, Dick Benson, who is uh, one of the fathers of uh, testing, uh, direct marketing testing. Um, I didn't meet him per se in person, but I talked to him on the phone a few times and I was arguing with him about a product I was selling. And he said, well, you, you know, you called me and you can argue with me all you want, but it's not <laughs> going to work. And I said, I'm going to prove Dick Benson wrong. But guess what? Dick Benson was correct. <laughs> uh, so, so him, Herschel Gordon-Lewis, Bob Stone, those are some of the folks, Rocket Ray Judkins, that I got to, to know. Um, Brian Kurtz is an outstanding direct marketer, uh, somebody I've known for several years. Uh, he runs the Titan program. Uh, just a really, really bright guy who has a passion for measurability. Uh, Alan Rosenspan, one of my favorite direct marketers of all time, uh, just just a really smart guy who understands that testing and um, you know fortitude are really what's important. And interestingly enough, we had a, a what they call a grand control, which is so, sells like millions or hundreds of millions of products in the direct mail realm. And uh, they actually hired Alan to, uh, to beat our package. Mm. And um, I think he said it took five or six or seven goes at it. <laughs> uh, so that, that was a compliment in a way, you know. Uh, but yeah, so, um, so those are a couple off the top of my head. And, you know, anybody that practices smart direct marketing, uh, understanding, you know, some of the basics, yeah. Uh, those are folks that I really, uh, and, and I meet folks on a, a weekly or monthly basis who I didn't know. For instance, you, Jeremy, I, I was, like I said at the beginning when we were uh, talking prior to going live, I, I'm shocked we haven't met each other over these years. You know, I just... Uh, a lot of mutual connections. Um, I mean, Brian Kurtz is amazing in his book, Over Deliver. And um, I did, I have interviewed... Um, Herschel Gordon Lewis. And then I, I'm curious what resources you recommend. Someone listening is like, I believe direct response is really the foundation of, of everything. And, you know, like you mentioned, the um, the picture, like what we're looking at here, the goal of that is to draw you in, to read the headline. And like one of my favorites is Joe Sugarman's book where he just breaks it down so simply, which is like, what's the goal of the headline to get you the subhead? What's the goal of the subhead to get you the first sentence? What's the goal well, of the first sentence? second sentence? So I'd love to hear you some of your favorite resources out for people who want more. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to digress just for a second. Go ahead. Um, yeah. one, one of the things very early on, uh, you're talking about Joe Sugarman, and I'm so glad you brought up his name. So he used to have a product called Blue Blocker Sunglasses. Totally. And yeah. Back in the day, they used to run infomercials live. Okay. So um, they're, they're, on, um, they're on the camera and Joe's holding this with, with the host. And he says, you know, we, these are so good. We're going to send you two pair and, you know, they're virtually indestructible. And he says, watch this. And he drops a pair of the sunglasses off and it snaps at the temple. And he picks it up and he goes, now, that's why we give you two pair. And by the way, <laughs> if it does break, it's going to break here. And we'll give you a new one without skipping a beat. And I was like, that's impressive. Uh, <laughs> and if you ever, if you talk to him again, I mean, ask him about that story. I think, I think that's pretty cool. 
Um, Dave, David Ogilvie, who is, uh, you know, a lot of people consider him the king of advertising. He called direct mail his secret weapon. So, uh, you know, looking at uh, anything that Ogilvy may have wrote uh, on direct marketing, direct mail, uh, that's a really, really good resource. Um, uh, you know, subscribing to uh, blogs and podcasts like you have, those are, are good resources. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to start at some point a podcast, not that everybody should listen to me, but um, th there's just so much information. I'm, I'm in my office here and I, in my office and uh, the, whole, the whole suite here we're in, I probably have a thousand books, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot on direct marketing. Yeah. Um, very, very many on direct marketing, but yeah. So I would, I would say, um, looking at, um, not only marketing books, but sales books and how to, um, how to weave that sales message into, um, what you're doing. NLP, yeah. um, neuro linguistic programming, they have, um, they have a really good website and some resources that you can look into as well. And, uh, you know, understanding copy and copy from a sales and a marketing perspective. There's a book that actually boardroom where Brian used to work, Brian Kurtz. It was called Secrets of Super Selling by, um, I can't think of the guy's name right now. But anyway, one of the things in there that was really interesting to me was when you're talking to somebody and you say, um, I hear what I hear what you're, you say, do you hear what I'm saying? And I say, yeah, I, I think I see what you're saying. Well, that's the wrong response because you're using the cue of hearing. So I should say, yes, Jeremy, I understand. I hear what you're saying. And I know that sounds small and but again, that's one of those things that people, people feel hey, understood. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I can relate. Is this oh, yeah, the one, Grant? Is it this one? That's John J. McCarthy's right Secrets yep. of Super Selling? Yep, that's it. Yeah, that's a okay. great book. Buy it. If it's amazing it, with these, like, just treasure trove. It's $9.53. You know, it's yeah. just yeah, inexpensive. Yeah, that, that uh, there's actually something. Uh, there's a guy named Ed McLean who wrote... Um, a whole series of uh, he called them monologues on testing, hmm. and um, I, I I tried for years to find a copy of the monologue, and I finally found one copy. Hmm. And believe it or not, it was in a library about twenty minutes from where I'm sitting. Wow! It was a college library, so I asked them if I could buy it, and they said no. So I just made a bunch of copies. And uh, yeah, exactly. Ed McLean, the basics of testing, you know, and wow. you probably can find it online. Uh, Think and Grow Rich, great book to read. Um, uh, that super selling book. Uh, again, so many, so many resources. Uh, Bob Stone's um, uh, Successful Secrets of uh, Direct Marketing is, a, is like, a, it is a textbook. I taught uh, direct marketing at the MBA level for about 15 years at Concordia University, Wisconsin. And that was the, the book that we used. And then hmm. um, Ruth Stevens, I don't know if you're fam familiar with her. She's, no. uh, she's a good B2B uh, marketer that, that does some good things. And again, there's a lot of resources and I'll follow up with a list maybe that you could include at some yeah. point me after this. Yeah. I love it. And I want to talk about uh, for a second, we'll go on the other end of the spectrum, I think from uh, dimensional mail, direct response, like mailing actual, you know, stuff in yeah. your physical in, we'll talk about AI because you've been using AI for over a decade. But before we get to that, I'd love for you to walk through. Um, I have pulled up here. If you are listening to it and you can watch the video as well, I'm looking at the website, Clexado, um, and talk to me about Clexado and what you did with them. Yeah. So, uh, Clexado is, um, part of, a. uh, English uh, based in London, a company called Hikma Pharmaceuticals. And um, we have a process that we follow, which we might get into later. And I'll tie that into a story with Hikma, but Plaxado is was just launched. It was actually just launched last week, as a matter of fact. Wow. And um, 
this is a campaign I'm very, very proud of. It's B2B and some B2C, but mainly B2B going to um, uh, EMTs, firefighters, police, schools, any place that may have a need if somebody overdoses, what this does is a single shot nasal spray that will save their lives. Mm. And if you're not lo- watching the video, there is a picture there. It says break glass in case of overdose. And there's a picture of the actual product. I mean, it, the actual product is in the, in the um, box there. Yeah. Yeah. So again, um, just, just a campaign that is really close to me because not who they are or anything like that. It's because it's a product that's needed. It's going to save lives. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of this. We're doing all their digital advertising. Uh, we did the website. We're going to do all their banner ads, email, so on and so forth. As things pop up, we work with more and more things on more and more things with uh, Hickman, Claxado. But uh, again, just a, just a really cool product that um, we think is going to have a huge impact. It's already gotten international play. And uh, once the marketing really kicks in in the next month or two here, I think you're going to see some uh, pretty cool results. So for, for them, talk about the B2B component. So, Mm -hmm. um, and what, because there's probably a lot of use cases for it. How do you decide who to go after and who to prioritize and and who do you end up targeting? That's a, that's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, So it always starts with fact-based analysis or research. And a lot of times people come to me and say, okay, you're an expert on uh, direct, direct marketing. What would you do? And I say, I don't know. I have to have the data tell me the story. And they're like, well, I thought you knew what you were doing. And I'm like, we need to do the <laughs> fact-based analysis because I'll come in with a prejudiced idea and that's not what we want. So in the case of Paxato, Don't quote me on this, but I think there's like 37 or 57 zip codes in the whole United States that make up like 80 to 90% of all overdose deaths. So Hmm. you start there. You start going, okay. It's like direct response meets 80, 20. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, so uh, we, we said, okay, these are the zip codes. Uh, You know, just to, to keep it simple, we'll just say, okay, there's 25 zip codes. What we need to find in those 25 zip codes is superintendents of schools, principals of schools, police stations that are in the area, EMT and firefighters that are in the area. And, you know, it goes on and on and on Mm. target audiences as we rank them from top to bottom as far as who needs it. And then reaching out to them in a sophisticated manner that includes uh, using AI with targeted banner ads, dimensional direct mail things along those lines. So uh, it's all about the data. And as a direct marketer, it's always been about the data. But now as everybody demands, I won't say once, demands measurability in their marketing, uh, those who understand data and testing are the ones that are going to succeed. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty proud uh, to say I'm part of this launch. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, it's, it's, that approach is pretty interesting because you can go anywhere with this, but then you kind of segment in the data go, where are the zip codes in the US that uh, have this stuff going on? And then where within those zip codes, where is this stuff happening? And those are the, it makes perfect sense when you lay it out like that, but yeah. uh, it's not so obvious from the beginning. Um, yeah, and, I mean, sometimes you know, people forget the, base, the basics of direct mail. And I'm going to use a term that I would say the majority of the audience won't understand. Uh, and I could be wrong. Hopefully I am. Uh, census tracts. So what happens in a zip code is you you can break down a zip code into the five digit zip code, the the zip plus four, the nine digit zip code to, to get it smaller. But if you even want to get smaller than that, there's census tracts, which within that zip plus four, there might be a hundred of them. And we might be only interested in 30 of the hundred of the 100. And that's what Uber targeting is about understanding and knowing how to use data, where to use data, what, what are the assets and limitations of data become critical, not only for everything that we do as far as measurable marketers and direct marketers, but really for any marketing going forward, in my opinion. Yeah, I love that. Um, 
What about from, so we mentioned AI, you, you talk, you mentioned it briefly about how you, you used it with this. Um, talk about how you've been using it um, okay. over yeah, the past so, 10 years and now. Yeah. So um, we have a, a patented, a partner with a patented uh, software program. And what, what the software does is um, it actually gets smarter and smarter as you move forward. So the problem that um, exists when you're explaining this to people is they think of a traditional media buy. I want to reach females 25 to 54. Well, what this does is let's say we use that as a starting gauge. And um, what this does is it goes, it gets more finite, more finite, more finite as it continues to move and figures out who's clicking, who's converting, who's buying, okay? And an, a really good example is uh, Zondervan Publishing, which is out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, they print just about every kind of Bible you can imagine. And uh, they came to us and they had three Bibles they wanted to market. One was the, the college Bible, kids that were going off to college. The leadership Bible, which was really more for groups getting together and studying things like that, you know, as a group. And then my all-time favorite, uh, the homeschool mother Bible. And we said, okay, why don't we, why don't you give us the data you have and we can start running these ads? And they said, we don't, we don't have any data. We, we just don't have the data because it's at retail and they don't share it with us. So like I said, using that 25 to 54, we started really broad, right? And then as we honed in, after about two or three weeks, we give them our first report and we said, here's the first report. And uh, it was something like uh, 33 year old um, rural mother of three with an income of X and X, you know, and then all the, these other demographic and psychographic attributes. And they said, well, what is this? And we're like, these are the people who are buying your Bible. And I'm like, we, we've never seen data like this. And what, what our system allows you to do is find, you know, finite and, and really target in on that group. Now there's some good and some bad with that. Let's, you know, the, the good is, okay, this is who I think my audience is, but in reality, this is who it becomes. But if you still want to reach that other audience, you're not moving them. You're not, there's a reason that they're not responding and that's where testing comes in. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to test uh, a different set of uh, headlines, uh, a different offer, different copy, what have you, test, you know, try to test one thing at a time and uh, you, you move that way. and we always start with a set of two or three different approaches, and then we analyze. And it's not uncommon for one group to be responding to one set and another group to be responding to another. And that's how AI, we, again, like you said, we've been using it for over a dozen years. And a couple of years ago, people were like, AI and machine learning, oh, it's the greatest thing. And I'm like, well, you, you can hire uh, Joe over at his agency uh, who's learning on your dime or you can hire somebody who's done dozens and dozens of these programs successfully. And uh, I, I just think for, uh, you had mentioned email. Everything from email forward is really direct marketing. Yep. And digital is a really good example as well. It started off, if you remember, oh, look at how cool this is. Look at all these great graphics we can do. But there was no sense of measurement, tracking, even though it was in there. Now that's becoming a must. Hmm. If you don't, if you can't track it and you can't measure it, why do it? I want to go don't. through a little bit, um, Grant, about the, this direct branding uh, mm -hmm. methodology. But before we do, I'm just curious. So you look at Clicksado. They are an international company. Um, I'm curious how they found you in okay. Wisconsin. Okay, that's a good question. So um, we do a lot of insurance work as well. And um, we did work with, I think, five of the Obamacare co-ops ACA um, work. And one of our clients um, was a lady who was at InHealth Ohio, which was the co-op set up in Columbus, Ohio. And initially we went to talk to them and they said, well, you know, you're saying the exact same thing that somebody else is saying that's local, all things being equal, we're going to go local. Yeah, that's fine. I get it. 
A year later, they call us and said, well, you know, that whole list that they promised, we got nothing. So we come in, we, we do a campaign with them. And in eight weeks, I think we picked up, uh, it, was, it was about 20,000 new members in eight weeks. And now these aren't responses. These are people who actually sign up and become members for the insurance. So but because the, the funding got cut off, uh, again, that gets into a whole another can of worms most of the co-ops went out of business. So when we um, went in uh, for an exit interview with our client, she said, you know what? I've worked a lot of firms. You guys did what you said you're gonna do. You got results, you proved the results. So when I get a new job, I'm going to bring you in if at all possible. So she left in Health Ohio, cause they shut down and she went to HICMA. At that time it was called West Ward Pharmaceuticals. And um, after about six or eight months there, she, she says, come down to Columbus and meet with my boss. So we meet with him and he says, uh, well, I'm in, a, I'm in a quandary. I'm with an agency in New York. I don't like them. And you have no pharma experience. You have, you have nutraceutical vitamins, but that's not pharma. Okay. So I said, well, we have this methodology. And uh, he asked, I thought, a really smart question. He said, okay, what would you do if you were me? And I said, well, my understanding is the agency you're with in New York, you don't like. He said, no, I can't stand them. I said, okay, give me six months. We'll implement this process. If after six months, things don't work out, we will turn everything over. You can start with a clean slate. You can hire whoever the heck you want. And we'll say we, you know, we gave it our, we gave it the best try we could. Uh, and that was about 12 or 13 drugs ago. <laughs> so obviously um, our stuff is working and just like anything, it boils down to relationships and somebody, you know, really rooting for you or pushing you and everybody has a process, but this is really the process that we follow, which is like I said earlier, let the data tell the story, fact-based. This is, this is what the data is telling us. And again, I can tell you many times people are like, that can't be right. That, that, that's not what we know. Well, I'm just telling you what the data says. Yeah. So either you're successful or we're missing somebody or there's a big opportunity that we should look to explore. Yeah. I, lo I love to have you walk through the process briefly. Um, and then I was talking, funny you say that, Grant, you know, to um, Diana Freik, who runs Retail Voodoo. She's got a great podcast, the Gooder Podcast. We talk about this exact thing, which is they help CPG companies. And um, they, it's like someone, you know, they get all these requests. Well, have you helped a popcorn company in rural Iowa? Well, no, but we have this methodology, right? And it's about the strategy methodology that this can work across, even if you don't have specific experience in pharma or whatever it is like there is this process so if you could walk me through a little bit about the you know and if you're watching the video you can see i just pulled up in front of me a bit about the direct branding process and and just kind of highlight a few things here that'd be that'd be great yeah so again it starts with fact-based analysis um it looks at everything from market conditions what the future mar market is uh is is supposed to look like based on facts what your competitors are doing, how they're doing it, all that kind of stuff. And it's laid out here right in front of us. It's really about intelligence, right? It's about having the data tell us what, what's going on, primary, secondary research. Sometimes we do uh, messaging workshops. Sometimes we do personas. It depends on the engagement, the size, and of course, the time that we have in order to do things. But once we get through that fact-based analysis, then we start the branding and marketing strategies, which is really understanding, like an IMED, understanding what's the messaging we're going we're gonna to go out with. What's the rationale behind what we're going to do? Who are we going to market to? How do they look different? Um, you know, what, what does the persona look like? And again, just if you don't have time or money to do personas per se, just look at their titles and figure out, you know, what their day-to-day -day activity is. Some of it is common sense. And then, um, you know, we go into the execution really after that, which is building the program components. 
Now, one of the things I really want to touch on is if you look at building program components, and if you go up just to the earlier one, Jeremy, um, branding, most of my competitors flip that. So they'll say, oh, I know what you need. You need email or you need trade shows or, and I'm like, no, we need to, we need to understand. We need to figure out the strategy and then tactics and then how we're going to implement them. And again, it seems like it should follow this process, but I promise most of them will say, here's what we do and this is what you need to do. But that doesn't mean necessarily it's what you should do. So I think that's an important distinction. So you build the program components, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. You do the creative brief. You present concepts. You walk through the concepts with the client. You agree. Then you start the copywriting, which is very, very critical. And, uh, you know, you go from there. And then you execute and test. And then you just keep testing in that circle. So, um, uh, the track and measure. So if you don't track and measure, you can't do it, but this is a continuous loop. And what, what works today might not work in three months. Does the weather stay the same outside? No. Do gas prices stay the same? No. You know, things like that. And that's why you always have to be in this continuous, um, this continuous uh, improvement loop because things change and competitors come, they go, some competitors might think, okay, I'm going to get more aggressive and really start to steal market share. Are you, are you prepared for that? And if you do constant testing, you're going to be two steps ahead of them. They can come in, but you're going to be like, eh, we, knew, we knew that a year ago. <laughs> and uh, you can continue to grow. Grant, first of all, thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out responsory.com learn more check out more episodes of the podcast and grant me the first one thank you so much and thanks everyone oh, yeah thanks for having me what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walk through the fire came out better on the other side see nice like a beach if you find the same